Good morning, everyone, and welcome to the second panel of the second day of the 2017 Sports Analytics Conference. My name is Barry Brudney. I'm a first year MBA student here at Sloan, and I am extremely happy to be able to be the presenter for today's panel, the future of basketball analytics, or as we like to call it, ball don't lie. And I'm extremely happy to be able to present the panelists for today's discussion. Starting from my left, we have Luis Scola, current NBA player. Mike Zarin, assistant GM of the Celtics. Vinny Zalnegro, former NBA player and head coach. Sue Bird, point guard of the Seattle Storm. Dean Oliver, VP of data science for True Media. And our moderator for today is Zach Lowe, ESPN senior writer. The panel for today will last 45 minutes, followed by 15 minutes of Q&A. In order to be able to submit your questions, we ask that you please go through the Twitter app using the hashtag futureofbball. The questions with the top mentions will be selected by our moderator. And with that, I'll hand things over to Zach. Hey, everybody. Uh, first of all, thanks to all. This is the biggest uh, panel, I think, in the history of the Sloan Conference. There's, nice. the, this is, Vinny is a last minute edition. Luis is a semi last minute edition. So thanks for everyone for participating. OK, the future of uh, basketball analytics. I think you got to start with the, the sport view stuff and the cameras. and. One of the research papers that I thought was really good at this conference was about mapping possessions, using the camera data to map like literally what happens on possessions. How do players move? And the focus was on how do the Houston Rockets generate corner threes? And just what patterns of movement are there? And it was a great paper and a lot of work went to it, but my reaction was I don't really need a paper to tell me how the Houston Rockets generate corner threes. I know how they generate corner threes. So I wanted to start by pointing out that A, that work was great, and B, from a front office perspective, for, for Dean and Mike, what's the next step from a paper like that? Like, what's buried in there that can help me win basketball games? Like, what little skills are, are, are maybe gonna be highlighted in that sport view data that maybe aren't so obvious that help me lead to winning? What are you looking for in there that's interesting to you from building a winning team? Defense. Defense is, you know, you're talking about how they set up a corner three. I, I'm always looking at, okay, if you're saying this is what they do and that's what they do, how do I take those elements away? And then what's their counter gonna be? And it's always the defensive side. What's the better positioning? Because it's, I, I think that's been underrepresented in traditional work. And the defensive side that wasn't in that paper, I don't think as much. That's what you look for. Yeah, the, the big philosophical stuff is not where it's at in that data, I don't think, as much as the little things, right? So yeah. which guys get hung up on screens? Should you go over or under against this combination of guys in a pick and roll? Um, we, you know, we didn't, coaches talk about those things all the time, and we never used to know. You could say, right, I think Brian Scalabrini is a good screen setter. He says he is, that's for sure. But, um, <laughs> but, but now we actually know. Like, he was good at setting screens. Um, and so or whoever it is that you're tracking now, because we actually have every screen identified and we can look at what happened and who was involved in it and what was the angle that someone was dribbling at, and those sorts of things. So, I mean, more than should you take a lot of threes, which is a question that seems to be coming up a lot, um, it's those little things that you'll look at in that data that let your analysts talk like coaches. And you think there's stuff in there that that stuff helps you win. That stuff can sure. be like what defense, what's, what's interesting about defense? What are you looking for? You mentioned positioning. There's another paper about like we're starting to see how like what limbs are doing uh, and, and like what arms are up. Like what's interesting to you? Uh, certainly for a long time we've been able to determine, okay, corner threes, wing the above the break threes in terms of what's important. But then how do they get them? And then there's a sequence of, okay, how often do they, they switch, how often will they set the down screen and these kind of things, and just give a coach access to the percentage of time that they're setting up these shots. Because before we could say, you wanna take away the wing three for, for Steph or whomever, but then, okay, what's the percentage you wanna give them up here versus down here? Now you look at the percentage of, of ways they set those, each of those up, and you give that to a coach, and then they say, okay, yeah, this way. Uh, how, it, how often have the players here been told, like, high hands? Sure. Right? All what, the time. Right. So what if I came to you and said, well, guess what? You've only been doing it 10% of the time. And then I had the video linked to that to show you that you're just running up at the guys and not challenging the shot. 10%? That, He's that on be, the bench. <laughs> right. So that's, there you go. Body pose is important. Well, well it's, I think it's important to highlight that what seems like some small detail, do I really need to know that? In a basketball game, generally speaking, it comes down to what, two minutes, 
of play, a run, a team goes on, you know, an 8-0 run, there goes the game. And these, these happen so quickly. So these little details, if you can fix them, take care of them, could literally win you games, even if it's one high hand at the very end or in the middle or whenever. So it's, it's, I just think it's important to, to understand that. Even though it's some small, small detail, it'll win you a game. And I think the timing, actually, the timing of high hands, because one of the things that, that gets taught, uh, that I was taught when I was young, is the timing of when you get out to the shooter is critical. And I think this can actually tell you whether your timing is good. And I haven't seen that done yet, but it is important. You get the guy who puts his hands up like after the guy's shot, just yeah, like, say he's that's, doing that's high that's hands. Right. <laughs> I did it. But as a it's better than Julia Local Ford just standing there and doing nothing for two minutes. <laughs> <laughs> but, but, uh, but as a coach, it's not only what you can help your team do. Looking back uh, when I was coaching, obviously, there's ways to use the data. But I think what Dean said is very important, too, in the sense that it's what you can take away from the other team. Those are the things you're looking at, not only the data to build a relationship with a player. I always talk about as a coach trusting your eyes when you watch, but the numbers reiterate that or the stats or the data do, but also giving it to the player and letting them see, hey, it's not only what I'm talking about, here's the actual numbers to help you be better. It, it just helps the communication factor from one side of the data to the coach to the player, and it's always about the communication with the player to help them understand how he can improve individually to make the group better. How often did you make those numbers up just to get the player? <laughs> just once in a while. I'd just call you and you would give me the numbers and it was perfect. So it was perfect. Mike, you were talking before the panel about like, we, we've spent 10 years at this conference talking about like, how does one side talk to the other side and blah, blah. And what we haven't spent a lot of time talking about is like, can, what numbers matter for players? Like, what do they want to know about themselves? So we have two, I'm going to just say, we have two Hall of Fame players on this panel right now. Um, that's right. And, um, like, and, and very curious about analytics. Like, either one of you, what, what have you did, you, did the analytics actually ever tell you something about yourselves that you didn't know? Or, or was, conversely, was there ever something that, like, Daryl Morey tried to get you to know about yourself, but you're like, I don't want to know that because it's going to get in my head. I'm going to think about it too much. Did you ever learn anything like that? Yeah, I think I learned a lot of things from numbers. Uh, the problem is, like, early in my career, I was kind of like disregarding all that. You know, you play for the feel of the game. You're thinking, you know, the game is intuitive. you got to go out there and play. Just work hard, play hard, make the right play, and all those things. And you learn. You learn different things, and you evolve as a player. Usually it happens when your body doesn't react that well. You start looking for different things that can help you to continue to play at a high level. And you start looking at other stuff. And at some point along that process, I, I got into numbers. That, well, what can I do uh, you know, to continue to play hard or a high level, continue to help the team? And obviously, I discovered some stuff about my game. Some, like I was looking for the bad stuff because that's the things you want to shave. And like we all know, I was bummed, but the post game is not a good thing. The long two is not a good thing. Those were things that I was doing. And you had to shave them out of your game because they're bad. And to the point before we were talking, I think like what is it that is going to help us win games? We, we're still trying to figure that out. You know, we have all this data, all these raw numbers, a whole bunch of numbers. Sometimes somebody came and tell you, uh, I'm very curious, so I always talk about number guy, read numbers guy about numbers and, and what's out there. And they come with this study or research or this number, and they say, well, we figured this out. And what's the conclusion? Well, the best idea is LeBron. And I was like, yeah, we kind of knew LeBron was good. <laughs> we, do, we didn't need this like, three months of study yeah. to figure that out. So how can we put this into something that helps me today to win this game or to practice better. And I, I think we are a little bit in that process. And, I, and that's the reason why I think numbers is such a big deal right now, because it's a, it's a niche now. What can you do to get ahead of the curve? What can you do to be in front? Somebody's going to get it down, and we're all going to be chasing them. You know, it's the way the NBA works. Somebody feels somebody discovers something, and everybody sees their success, and they're just trying to catch them. And then eventually they do, and then somebody else comes with a new thing. I think that thing right now is numbers. The analytic people, they know them, they understand them. Coaches, they understand a little better than before, but not so much, and <laughs> players are way behind. So how we transitioning from the very smart people that got it all the data together, simplify for the coaches, and the coaches 
to, us, to assimilate all that, simplify it and send it to the players in a very much simpler message that can help them win that night. So I think that process is where we are right now. And what, that's why every team is really, really pushing for it. They work, they go being very aggressive at it. Yeah, what do you actually want to know about yourself? Um, well, there's a thin line between wanting to know things about yourself and seeing these percentages and it becoming a mental problem. So I was told, I mean, I already knew it, but I was told, oh, you go better, you shoot better going left. I'm like, yeah, I know. And now all of a sudden I'm in a game and I see a team pushing me right. And I'm like, wait a minute, you know? And then you try to go right and you're mental about it. So there's this thin line between, again, wanting to know all that and then it becoming a mental problem. But it does force you to work on things in your game. And that's definitely been my journey the last couple years in terms of the numbers and how it affects my game. And now I'm kind of getting to the point where I want to know where my teammates are successful. So, you know, if I've got Brianna Stewart and Jewel Lloyd, you know, to my left and my right, and I know Stewie shoots great over there and Jewel's, I want to know that so I can go to the, you know, the player that's, basically I want to put my teammates in a, in a position to be successful. And that's where I've kind of gone with, with this numbers thing. I'm, I'm studying that more. I mean, it's, I'm 36, there's only so much I'm going to change at this point. <laughs> I am who I am as a basketball player. But if I can help my teammates be successful, you know, and numbers plays a role in that. My, so, my, my experience, though, was that using numbers to help my coach or my players know themselves was not as good as helping them to know the other teams. That was always my experience. They knew, George Carl knew they his knew team yourself. really well. And I, I think you probably know yeah, your you know teammates yourself. before the numbers. Yeah. Were there. But there, there's always a human element to it, like, like Sue yeah. just said and like Dean just said. You know, the numbers are great, but that human element that can combine the data. But some players you give that data to, it slows their mind down, which slows their feet down, and they get mental. They don't want to go right, or they're, they're trying to do something they're not. So knowing your player, their personality, building that relationship with them, obviously to incorporate some data that can help them. But some guys, like Lewis, uh, I could give him 10 things that he could digest them. There might be another younger player I might be only give one or two things to, and that might be too much for him. So knowing that human element, I think, is very important, too, when you're incorporating the, the data. The, the people who are curious about this stuff, it's, it's not like a perfect overlap with the people who can play and not think about it. Yeah. Like Those are two right. separate groups, and there's some overlap, and there's some not overlap. Right. So we talk a lot about what information the, you know, the players should get, and you don't want to be the guy keeping info from the players, but at the same time, you don't want to mess up their game, and that's why you have good coaches, hopefully. Um, they might be saying the same thing to the players they're always saying, send this guy left, but we just are more sure about it now. What I, what I keep telling the young guys, uh, you know, this is happening. It's, in 10 years, players are going to be able to understand all these numbers. They're going to have like a very good education in analytics, advanced stats, and all these things. Uh, it's going to happen. So you want to be, you want to be ahead. You want to be one of the first ones to understand it, because you will have to understand it anyway. You might be the last one of the team or the first one of the team. You might want to be the, the first one in the NBA or the last one in the NBA, but you will have to understand it. So the sooner you start, it has to start working right now because it's happening. It's just no way to stop it. More and more stuff's going to be online too, right? So a guy, if, if he's not getting it from you, but he goes on some yeah. website and sees something about his game and you haven't told him, like, that's not a good thing either. Luis, do you think the game, you, were, you, you lived through this transition of how the NBA is now. You had to learn how to shoot threes, yeah. you know, and, and change your game. Do you think the league is, do you have more fun playing now than you did 10 years ago or less fun? No, I have, I have the same amount of fun. I, I think just playing the game is fun, you know, regardless of how, if you shoot a three or a two or a post up or, a, you know, dunks are more fun, but I've never done those, so <laughs> <laughs> I, I don't, that didn't change Do you much. like watching the Rockets play? Yeah, I like it. I like it. I just, you know, I just like the idea of watching, you know, they, they got a really big planning in course and they executing it and it's working. I think it's fun. You know, you believing in something that nobody believed in before. You started, you changed everything and it's working. And I, I find that fascinating. I think uh, the NBA is fun. It's just a little bit different than before and it's exciting. The game is changing, but a, a player like Luis, he has versatility and has a skill set where he can go out and shoot threes. There's some guys that are gonna lose their jobs because the game is changing where they're not as skilled where before years ago, hey, if I'm a bruiser, I set good screens, or I'm a great rebounder, or whatever, those players are still having an advantage, but the versatility player and the player like a Luis that's so skilled, he can run pick and roll, he can shoot a two, he can make free throws, but now he can step out and shoot a three and open the court up from a number standpoint because the game is so pick and roll oriented, that's an advantage, but there isn't a lot of guys that can do that like him. So that's a, that, that's a big number. 
a lot of this is about communication. So I want to I want to get specific. I don't want the two front office guys, former and current. I want an example of an argument that you lost, an analytics-based argument with your coach or your GM or whoever, your owner, that did not go well for you. And maybe maybe it was good that you lost or for your franchise, or maybe it was bad that you lost. But give me, give us, take us behind the curtain. I know you have an example because yeah, you right. told so, me it. So there was. <laughs> This is only 45 no, minutes, too, by the way. There, there's a, oh, you think there's a lot of them? <laughs> <laughs> we were running a play, and I couldn't stand it. And um, I won't say when or, or who the coaching staff was, but, but uh, I, I went to them, with, like, all prepared to say, well, this play was terrible, with all these information. And uh, we were mostly running it early in the game, and then we'd go away from it later. And I kept thinking, well, this is... You know, they realize later in the game it's not working each time. Like, why do we keep? And the whole point of it was just to set up something that we would run later that would confuse them because they thought we'd be running the first thing. See, I think that's I no that's very football-y. That's I didn't I didn't really realize that was part of. So you you I guess you lost does stuff but... like that constantly. We I've talked to the Patriots about this stuff. It's, well, yeah, well, but you also, might... it's not cheating. Come on. <laughs> what about you? Uh, this, you you've you've worked for some interesting. Some interesting teams. The big, the biggest downer of this whole conference for me was that you were still contractually obligated to not talk about the Kings, which is like I, I wanted the whole panel to be you talking about the Kings, but we can't, we can't do that. So give me an example of an argument, though. And my example is is from the draft when I was with the Nuggets, uh, for sure. So the uh, and so working with George Carl, who I have a ton of respect for, we there was a player, and this is when you're working in the draft, it's mostly personnel. You're working with personnel people, not the coaches, but you end up trying to convince the coaches at the end. And uh, we were looking at Richard Hendricks in the year he got drafted. He was a power forward out, out of Alabama. And uh, the numbers I had on him were very good, which is not the end all, but you, you go and look at these guys. And I did a lot of work on him. Uh, he ended up get, getting drafted by someone else. And then we got him for summer league. Um, at least I was able to win the argument to get him for summer league. And I thought he played pretty well. And I had some numbers here. They just really didn't get into his use for, for the Nugget system at that point. And it was one of the, uh, you move on, because you, you don't expect to ever win 100% of these arguments at all, and it's fine. Um, but it was early on uh, with that, that group, and you get to understand their decision process. And, and certainly, I had a lot of respect before, and even more, actually, after that. He's had a, a pretty good career overseas, though, right? Yeah, he had a great career overseas. As a coach, did you ever, did you ever have to tell people, Get out of my face with the stuff. I don't want to hear. Oh it. yeah, for sure. And when they bring in these booklets, and I don't have all day to look at them or all week to look at them, and it's a time management thing, but you're always trying to get knowledge and information to help. But I think one thing Mike said is interesting is, as a coach, you might run a play set, but you might have the same alignment at the end of the game. But instead of it being a down screen, it's a flare screen. Instead of us running a high pick and roll, you're telling your big guy, same set. We ran this play early. It didn't really. Work. Now I want you to slip the pick and roll. So there's a human element, like I said before, where the analytics might say one thing, but as a coach, you're trying to put your players in an area of strength that you know a place that might work because they're jumping the pick and roll. This is going to be open, and you're dissecting that throughout the game to give your team an advantage. Um, one of the things that I'm curious about, you know, some, I'm sure you guys get asked this a lot from, from young people. I get asked it, like, how do I break into the NBA? I have all this analytics. Like, what kind of problems are teams interested in? And my response is, is, has become... Like, I don't need you to tell me who's good. I don't need you to tell me who's bad. I don't need you to tell me what works. And what, like, I know that. What I would, if I were a front office person, what I would want to know is, tell me what players on other teams, not who are good or bad, but who for some reason fit or don't fit with my team. A player we could get. What are the analytics of, like, of predicting how a player fits? So, for instance, if, if you were Del, De if Del Dems, if you were for the, the Pelicans, and Dell Demps came to you, any of you, and said, hey, look, we got a chance to get DeMarcus Cousins. We have Anthony Davis on our team already. You have two hours. Get me some numbers that will show me whether this will or will not work. Like, what do you do? What numbers are interesting to you? You're trying to get me to talk about the Kings. <laughs> oh, so move on, please. You really, is that really? Well, I guess that is Kings. Well, okay, what? I can't talk about players on other teams' <clears throat> rosters. Exactly. 
a team so. wants to acquire a second <laughs> yeah. big man who overlaps with their pre-existing big man, and you have two hours to produce an analytics report, what kind of things, I'm serious, what, what's interesting? I mean, you want to look at a player's skill set, see the things that they're good at, and see how those things would fit on your team. Are you already doing those things so it's not going to be particularly additive? Are they things that two people can be doing at once? Because if, like, if you have a guy who's a really good post scorer, and you add another really good post scorer, um, is that going to work? If, if you have a guy who's just good in the post and Isaiah Thomas is on your team and he's not a great screen setter, you know, that's something you might not want to acquire if he's going to play a lot with Isaiah. Because um, Isaiah is pretty efficient at scoring. So this is, you talked about the, you don't want to know who's good and who's bad and those kind of things. In order to get to a metric that says who's good and who's bad, you have a series of metrics for those skills that Mike is talking about. You stop there. You just don't put them all together to create this metric of who's good and who's bad. You stop at those skills. And you say, OK, we don't care about these skills because it doesn't matter in our system, or it matters less. These care, we care about a lot more. And that's and certainly what, you're, what we talk about with, with fit, with big men in the spacing. If, you're, if you want a lot of spacing and such, it's, it's, it's important to consider but but like, particularly when acquiring role players, you, you feel like your team is going to be the same and you just need to plug someone in. You got to figure out what's going to happen to this guy in our offense. Yeah. You know, are they going to be open at the elbow? If so, are they going to take a lot of elbow? You jumpers? have time to do that at the trade deadline? No, you got to figure out what you think oh. about the players beforehand okay. and have it all set up so that you can, you know, you have an idea of what each. But over the summer, you have a lot of time. It's very fast. At this point, it should be very fast. I mean, you can pull up answers within five minutes for most things. Yeah. Okay. So you have time to produce. You can you can pull up answers, and and, and you're you have just systems looking for, that you're looking quickly. at sometimes like oh, yeah. literally where they are on the floor. What yeah. areas oh, of the yeah. floor do they inhabit? Where, where that worked for us with Brandon Bass. Some we sort of knew that we were you know our four was going to end up open a lot in spots where KG was good from shooting and or uh, shooting from, and um, you know he was one of the, there were the the top guys shooting from those areas were like Nowitzki, Garnett, Brandon Bass, Chris Paul, and we're like oh wait Brandon Bass we can get Brandon Bass. Like, that spot on the floor is a spot where he shoots from a lot, and he's really good. Um, I'm interested in, um, this, is, this is almost like a sports science conference now, more than, a, more than like a traditional analytics conference. I'm interested in, we talked about this before, like, psychology and neurology. That's the kind of stuff, like, are we ever going to get analytics for that? Like, we go to the draft combine every year, and all these NBA teams ask crazy questions, like, you have... 90 cents and five coins. What coins do you have? How many balloons can fit in this room? <laughs> JaVale McGee says 10,000 balloons can fit in this room. I don't know what that tells me about, about JaVale McGee. So like, what, what like, uh, what? Why is everyone picking on JaVale McGee? Uh, it's, 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 it's the low hanging fruit. And you talk about the Wonderlick test in, in, in the NFL. Like, yeah. and, and we'll get to the neurology. You have some good neurology stories, but like, what, what do we know? What are we trying to know about um, the makeup of a player, and is any of that quantifiable? I think it's to get at what Vinny was talking about a little bit. How do you communicate with the player? If, if there certain players respond better to certain kinds of communication, that would be my simplistic, yeah. probably over the simplistic answer. I think you have to get a feel for the player. I mean, that's the most important thing. We're talking about, before we're talking about, you know, when I was in LA and we're doing trades or drafts, what I want to know about if we're trading for a guy, here's our play sets, here's our terminology defensively, how's he going to fit in, what is his percentage here because we're going to get him shots at this area or whatever it is. So having all of that, but at the end of the day, the communication, the human part of it, understanding the person sitting down and talking to them about what they're comfortable with, uh, knowing their background, um, their family situation, getting to know that person, not just as a basketball player, but as a human being and what, makes them tick what, what, what they struggle with from a communication standpoint. Do they like to be reprimanded in front of the whole group? Do they like to be, you know, put your arm around them and talk to them and get them to do things? Some players are very touchy, and especially the younger players that are a little bit more sensitive. Some of the veteran guys, they've been through it, they've had different coaches, they know what to expect, they know the game, and they're very comfortable in their skin. The younger players, the game is very fast. Especially for young guys, the game is fast. As you get older and experienced, the game slows down, you understand the terminology, and you understand the lifestyle and the commitment it takes, what you're eating, all the things that are thrown at you, how you can become the best player, all those things matter for, for, for young players especially. I think if I was a GM, I'd want to know how somebody performs 
obviously off the court, I mean on the court, maybe off the court as well, under pressure. pressure. That would be like the huge thing. I'd want to know if they retain information well. So maybe some of those questions, maybe they come back and ask an hour later. You know, I don't know. Because to me, what I see now, especially with younger players, and maybe just because they're young, I have no idea, maybe it's kids today, but <laughs> you'll put a play in like the day of the game, you then get in the game and they don't remember. I like cannot understand that. It drives me up a wall. And, but they forget. It's like they don't retain. There's something about that. So I'd want to know those two things like right off the bat. Is there a way to systematize that though or quantify it or, or, any, or like, know. you know, anything like that? Do, 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 are, will we have numbers for that at some point? I think if someone's telling you they can do it, you test them. I, and I, I think there are people who will tell you they have ways to do that and you have to test it. If you buy their system or you test their system for them, you better test those results because you don't want to do something that's actually going to hurt you. Did people, when you came into the league, did, did teams like test you on stuff? Like no, no, I didn't get, uh, didn't, after they signed me, they did a bunch of tests, uh, physical and stuff to see if I was healthy, but they didn't do that in the first time I came out. They're doing that a lot more now. And I think those numbers are, val are valuable, but uh, you need to put them in, in the context. You know, you have a guy to run fast or jump high. Well, you know, there's a lot of those. Um, I think you got to compare it with some other guys and see if it translates. You know, you got a guy that's strong, they jump high, that's see rebound. You know, he out rebound everybody. Maybe you test another guy the very same day that does not jump as high or is as strong, but they play in the same league and he rebounded more. So you put in the number in a context. He's strong, but, you know, he's not oh. taking... The whole, the we were talking about grit before. Like yeah. the grit is like the in thing now. Everyone's looking for grit. There's no way. I don't know that there's a way to quantify grit. But you were telling a story about like the neuro, the neurological stuff. Yeah. Like that to me is interesting though. So you were in Russia and your team had you jump through some hoops. <laughs> literally. <laughs> Almost literally. Um, yeah, I played in Russia for ten years, and one of the teams, um, the day of my physicals, which is you know typical physical stuff on the treadmill, heart monitor, blah blah blah. Then I sat in a room and without much translation other than like what I was meant to do, they put a piece of paper in front of me and it, it had like boxes, kind of like almost like crossword looking boxes. And I had to see how many I could put a dot in. And I just literally for like 30 seconds was dotting. And then another piece of paper with lines on it. And then I had to see like how many I could cross in like 30 seconds. And Key I walked out of the room and they skills. told me what my body fat was. It was bizarre. Yeah. <laughs> that was the end. That was the end. So and you have no circles. idea what happened to those results. I have results. no idea what happened to those results. <laughs> and you had to draw like circles you as had to fast draw, like, as you could, right? Yeah, like a circle as fast as I can, as many as I could. This and is literally in Russia? They were, Russia. Yeah, in Russia. Is anything like that in the NBA? Do you, do, 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 do you put players <laughs> in the draft room through these like puzzles or something? Even if you do, don't say you do. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. I, nothing like that. I mean, <clears throat> you might want to know how quickly someone reacts to something or if somebody can detect something moving in a sort of spatial way. Um, that, those are things that sort of might translate to basketball skills, but I don't really see how putting a dot in They're a They're probably ball. like, let me see how many crazy things I can yeah. get her to do. She's going to be a great teammate. There's a bunch of, there's a bunch of like vision tests that I know a lot of teams yeah. do where the, like, yeah. the light comes on over here and you yeah. have to... Yeah, and yeah, I was yeah. going to talk about that. We had that in a team and, and I was asking why was this for and say... It, it, uh, measure eye hand coordination, and we discovered that whoever is good at this is good at deflections. So the guys huh. are good at that. So I'm test myself, and we all test, and effectively it kind of like matches the deflection chart of the team. So me and a couple other players really do it every day, and we ended up becoming very very good at it. And we on the on the uh, on the table of the hand eye coordination, we climb. We were first, second, and third with a margin of difference. But we did not climb on the deflection list. <laughs> but that's interesting because people ended up getting good at the test. Right. You know, they train for the test. So they say, for example, they combine, you got a 40 yard, uh, that's what I need to get, be good at it. You forget to work on basketball, you work at that because that's the number is gonna get you in the draft or whatever. And you ended up being good at the test. But it does not translate if you train the, the, the test uh, exclusively versus if you train in basketball and then do the test without a, a specific training. I think when you're trying to get a good number on the particular test, it kind of changes the outcome of the results a little this bit. Is, yeah. This is what I meant by doing these kind of tests and testing the test to right. see yeah. if it actually makes a difference on the floor. 
in the game. That's what you gotta do. Well, and, and I think the, the wearable craze in the NBA is, is, um, is, is huge, and there are more and more companies here, and, and it's an issue in the CBA and going forward. And I would, you, you start to hear teams now, um, and I think this is actually part of the sort of influence of analytics people within teams. There's a skepticism that's burbling up about like, I'm not sure we know well enough that this stuff actually works. And is this device worth the money that we're paying? And what m other information do we need or what needs to be improved? So I'll just put it to like, anyone, like, what, uh, uh, where are we on this? Is like, you, like, some teams are even starting to divest themselves a little bit. Like, I'm not sure I want to renew contract X. Like, have, have any of you guys like learned? You, you mean huh? wearable contract? Wearable, acts, not yeah, player yeah, 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 yeah. Right. Um, like, uh, yeah, not player contracts. <laughs> have, have any of you learned like like interesting stuff about players and trends and fatigue or anything like that? Like, what are we looking for, and is it working? I mean, I would I would just say what we had talked about before is, you know, you might uh, do a psychological test with a player, and he's he's one of your smartest guys. He's well prepared. You might put in a new play set at practice. The next day, you might go over it and shoot around, and then you call a timeout during the game, and you put the play set in, and he might mess the play up. There's there's so much human, and then you'll talk to him later, like you know, you know, I was I was you know whether they have ADD, whether all these things that they could have as a player. You're trying to put them in a comfortable situation. You think they handle it, so that human interaction with that is the game is fast and guys get emotional and things happen or the play before he thought he got fouled so he's mad and his mind's on that because he just yelled at the ref and now you're trying to put it. So handling the human emotion is with the numbers I think at sometimes is as vital as you were saying with these tests. Mm -hmm. it would so, be interesting, you know, it's tough. It would be interesting to have a wearable that detects emotions actually. Yeah. <laughs> but um, what I have seen <laughs> with some of this, and I've talked to a lot of people doing the sports science stuff. And, and you're across I, multiple sports. So you're, yeah. yeah, I've been doing football a lot on top of basketball. And what I've seen is, I, there are a lot of people I respect on the sports science side. And so my default is that I trust them and I respect them. Doesn't mean you don't continue to look. You want to make sure that they're not doing any harm first, and you keep going. And with that, you're going to make sure then that what they're saying just makes sense. A lot of times they're look, they may be looking at heart rate and how, how long you can run, whether you're getting peak velocity, all this kind of thing. Are you practicing, practicing too hard or not hard enough? There's some of this, and it makes sense. Um, but yeah, you've gotta be doing the test. But if you have this bias that I, I trust them at least up front, and you're just gonna make sure that they're not doing any harm, you're going to keep them until you find those areas. Because we don't know where to look yet. We don't know how it may help. So you've got to keep looking. I think, I mean, the way I see it from a player is, all right, a coach says, hey, today's going to be an easy day. We're just going to stay half court. And then that practice is 10 times harder than the one if you were going up and back, you know? Because huh. you're cutting, you're doing this, you're doing that. And if what I understand, things like, um, I forget the name of it now. Zephyr? Zephyr. Zephyr, yeah. yeah. Can track that. And, and I, I have a friend who, he's a strength coach, and he talks about it. He's like, he tells his coach, listen. And the coach didn't buy it at first. You know, he like wasn't into it. He was like, no, 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 we didn't go up and down. He was like, that was 10 times harder than your practice the other day. And I think information like that is so crucial. And, and I'm sure there's tons of other data and other information that you do have to question, and it becomes a problem. But for me, if, if you tell me, I, we were saying this earlier, if you tell me I need nine hours of sleep, that's going to help me, I want to know that. If you tell me I need to eat a thousand more calories, I want to know that. And if there's some wearable that's going to tell me that, and that to me is like more black-white information, you know, that's yeah. like health and whatnot. Um, you want to control the things you can control. And then the other stuff, I mean, yeah. that's why we're all in this room, right? Figure out that other stuff. They're, they're putting together some of the perceptions of the players. You come out of this practice, uh, it's called an RPE, what's your per perceived exertion. And the story is all the players come out and they say that was like an eight or a nine, and a coach thinks it was a two. That's, yeah. that's kind of typical uh, for sure. But they're using that with the actual data from the tracking to get a <laughs> sense. Great. Yeah, to, to get a sense whether a player may be getting hurt. Because if you have someone who is correlated pretty well, oh, that really was about a seven or eight, an eight. And then one day they think it was like an eight or a nine, but everybody else thinks it was a two, maybe they're getting hurt. Or, would you wear it during games? Yeah, I would. Yeah. Yeah, I think it's interesting, and I'll be able, to, I'll, I'll be okay with sharing it too. Like I know there's a lot of debate about are you gonna use this against me? There's gonna be 440 players in the NBA next year, regardless, you know. 
Somebody, we're not cutting any job. And if you're dogging it, we already know. Yeah. You don't need the wearable to know. <laughs> and also, you know, people's going to guess. If you, they, they, may, they might know exactly or they might right. guess, but they're going to make the decision based on that regardless. And we're going to have players. It's just going to be a better play. We're going to have better information of the 440 players we have. I'm okay with that. I don't think that should be a problem. But I know a lot of players think differently. You know, this stuff is going to be used against me. Well, if you have a problem, it's going to be used against you, yes. But what, what happens if whatever wearable tells a very good thing about you is going to be used in your favor? So I, I don't think uh, it should be a problem. I think all this stuff is great. We got more information. We are more prepared. We have people studying behind the scene for us. We have people paying a lot of money for our health, for our performance. All those things are good things. Sometimes the problem is that we are demanding from all this, analytics, technology, sports science, to be perfect. But it's not perfect, and it doesn't have to be perfect. It just has to be better than the thing we were doing before. Tiny little bit better, that's enough for you to adapt it. And then eventually it's going to get better and better. But we can't ask them to be perfect. So sometimes they come and say, we got this statistic or this wearable, and it fails one time, and we're like, this, this is bad. Why are you making me do this? You're making me do this play, or you're making me wear this thing. That's one thing that is not accurate. Well, a lot of things were wrong before we got those. It's just better than with the thing we had before. It does not have to be perfect. What would you be curious to learn about yourself if you wore it during games? Are you curious about heart rate, or are you curious about, like, about I push off one leg more than the other, everything? All those things, I think, are extremely interesting. And also, there's a lot of times that you were, we were there in practice. So sometimes you finish practice and I kind of play this game. So I guess how hard a practice was for me, for my body. And then I look at, it, at the screen to see if it match. And a lot of times it does not match. You know, you're thinking like it was the hardest practice ever. And when you look, it's like, eh, no. So if it doesn't match, do you find that players just say, well, it's wrong? Or do, play, or do players just oh. think about like, Maybe I'm wrong, or do, do I? I think a lot of players just dismiss it as wrong. But what do you think? Yeah, I think it just depends on the player. Yeah. Kind of what we're talking about. Yeah. The ones that want to know and are interested in it probably don't just go. Eh. They probably question why. The others that maybe aren't sold on it, they're going to be like, yeah, whatever. See, that thing's wrong. <laughs> you get guys too who you know want to use it as an excuse. Sure. Right. Yeah. Right. But that doesn't mean you don't want to have it for everybody else who's not going. You know what I'm talking about. Yes. Right? So in terms of what? In terms of. Like how oh, to use an excuse. Yeah, I, I'm, I'm worked really hard today. I don't have to go lift now. See, the computer says I worked hard in practice. Um, but, but like, you just have to work at convincing that guy. Look, if you're, it's exactly what you said. Like, you're, you're going to get better if you pay attention to this stuff. 98% of the time, the team and the players' interests are perfectly aligned on these things. Um, so, I, I don't. The fact that someone might end up using it as an excuse or someone might lie about how hard they thought the practice was isn't a reason to withhold that from everyone. It also tells you something about that player. Right. You know, and what coaches want is they want time. You know, as, as a coach, you're always trying to manage your time. You know, but, uh, you know, the, the sleep deprivation things, the travel, uh, the, 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 the meetings instead of going to do a shoot around because we've only gotten five hours sleep and we have a game that day or using any of that information. I'd rather have a 30, 45 minute hard practice than a two hour practice, but I'm an old school guy. We used to have, you know, two weeks, we have two a days and we're practicing every day and they're three hour practices and, and there was none of this stuff that they have now. So why not use it? And as a coach, you're trying to get that information. How can I put my player in an area of strength, get them the most sleep, protect them from injury. You're getting all this information thrown at you. How can I use it to my advantage for my team? We, we found those drills that are you know, Less. really high intensity, and the, the coach kind of thought it was a throwaway drill, and he's, you know, they're tiring out players. Really? <clears throat> yeah. From the wearables? Absolutely. Because there's a lot of cutting or whatever yeah. it is. That's what goes back to what you were saying before about the half-court practice might actually be, yeah. might actually be hard. All right, Luis, you become the GM of a team tomorrow. <laughs> which, which, which down the line is a possibility. I'll hire myself. <laughs> well, yeah, whatever. I still playing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, you can sign yourself. There's some conflicts of interest that we have to protect against. What you're, you're, you're deep. I don't think people know how deep in the weeds you are within analytics. You and Manu are texting each other math issues. You have toys. You have like these things at your house, these sports science toys. 
What crazy stuff are you trying as GM? What are you curious about? Like, what, what would the numbers tell you to try in terms of players or strategy? Like I used to fantasize a lot, a lot about uh, me running a team and what would I do. And in the past, like, maybe some years ago, I would do all kind of crazy stuff. And, but then I had the chance to play with a lot of new front offices and coaches. And all of them come with these crazy ideas. It's almost like we all think that we had this idea that nobody had before. And most likely, like almost always, it's just like somebody had it before and they disregard it because it's, it was bad. It's, that's the reason why nobody's doing it. <laughs> so I kind of feel like, because of my experience, I kind of feel like that's the way we all feel and that's always a mistake. So I a little bit changed with the years. I think like right now I'll have a much more traditional approach uh, but I always think that it would be very interesting to run a team in an everyday bas basis with a, a game day uh, format, with a game uh, day type of template. Uh, we practice in a totally different way than the games. We practice early in the morning. We do all kind of different exercises. So I, I always felt like one of the things about analytics is the, the size of the sample. And when teams analyze their own team, they trying to see who plays well with who, and they run into the problem that they don't have enough minutes. So I felt like we, if you run a team, you can make, make it like a game. It's a practice, but we get in together, we're gonna play a game. Sometimes it's gonna be one quarter, sometimes it's gonna be two, sometimes it's gonna be a whole game, four quarters. We're gonna split the teams, one coach is gonna be one side, we're gonna prepare, this is gonna be team A, this is gonna be team B, we're gonna do a scout, we're gonna, everything like a regular game, and we will track stats. Huh. And we'll multiply by four if it's one quarter, and we will multiply by two if it's two quarters. And then we'll have a much bigger sample. Obviously, it's not gonna be the same, but if you put it in a game format, I think it's the, whatever you can get from that practice as an analytic standpoint is gonna be much closer to the game versus what you can get in a regular practice of what we do now. And you also have the uh, competitive edge you know, players will want to play. And you, you had to put this, whatever you came out with, you got to put it out there in the board. You know, these players playing a lot better than anybody else. And players don't like to see that. The other players won. That player would be happy, but everybody else would be like, he's taking my, my spot, he's taking my minutes. You know, and he's going to work harder. And it, it will raise the, the level of the team. I believe that could be something that I will look forward to do if I ever run a team. I would you abolish, shoot around. You abolish shoot around, around. <laughs> just out. I'm not. I wouldn't get rid of the the pregame, like meeting, the things you go over and shoot around. But the timing of it, it's. The, I think it's the most. I hate it. It's so stupid. Well, more teams are doing that. Yeah, yeah we don't yeah. do that game. Yeah. We, we'll do that on the road because it's the only time you can get the arena to yourself. But at home, yeah. we don't do that. Well, yeah, and I'm sure for NBA is different from WNBA. The whole charter flight thing. It changes. It just changes. Obviously, it's easier, but it just changes timing of things. For, for, for our league, shoot around is extremely popular. I want to say I'm on the team, the only team that does not have it. I'm, fair, I'm fairly confident that I'm pretty sure the other 11. Is that because you, you, have some you used your clout to get no, shoot around the ball? Sue said no more shoot arounds, they're done. If only. Um, no, my coach is a big believer on sleep. We were talking about people who sleep. She sleeps like 12 to 14 hours, it's insane. So she just didn't want to get up. I don't understand totally these people. I, know. I, don't, I don't understand how that's possible. She didn't want to get up, and then I got used to not getting up, and now I'm like, I will never do shoot around again. When I had to do it with the Olympic team, it was terrible. I was like, why am I, the, why are you Gino waking me up? Do you know makes you guys do shoot arounds? Are you kidding? And I'm like, is this for me or is this for you? Because if it's for you, I don't think we should do it. That's not fair. That's not OK. You guys have. It seems to be working for him, whatever why, he's like, doing. Tell me well. the benefit of it. <laughs> what was the crazy thing you wanted to try that the coaches just wouldn't do? A crazy strategy. Uh, a crazy so strategy? Did uh, you want to like crash actually, four guys to the Oh, I know what it was. Class? I know what it was. You didn't prep that. Uh, I, wanted, I wanted J.R. Smith to take a couple steps back and start shooting threes from where Steph is now. Dad, because it's open. And if he you. makes a couple of them, you spread the floor so much more. Well, I think that was it. I, and they would and Jr. wouldn't J, hold on. Jr. No, no, no. I don't talk. I don't talk. <laughs> you guys are good point. Maybe I should have just taken it straight to Jr. But no, I, I worked through the coaches. So yeah, you should have gone right to Jr. Smith. You would have <laughs> shot from out of bounds. <laughs> I've started to work on that. I'm like, wait a minute, because everyone's like, oh, when you get older, you gotta like figure out ways to get your shot off quicker, quicker, quicker. You hear all this quick, quick. And I'm like, what if I just take a step back 
and they have to travel longer, and I'm more I'm more open back here. That to me is like it makes total sense. Well, that's so I'm, I'm extending my range. That's being borne out now, particularly with Ryan Anderson and Eric Gordon, who are shooting 28 to yeah. 30 footers regularly, so right? Um, how much time do we have? Are we good? We're at 15. Do I have to use the iPad now? Is that what's happening? Okay. <laughs> if these questions aren't good, I'm just going to pick my own questions. <laughs> While he's looking, uh, don't hesitate to question your coach just because you're winning. Huh? Right? Like Gene, I would say, well, almost ever, so you must be working. He's winning a lot. That doesn't he's mean it doesn't mean you like, shouldn't ask about shooting. He's like coaching. Wow, kids. these are like sorted into fun questions and analytics questions. Wow. Should we take a vote? Gave away the secret. Um, the first question, I, no, I'm not going to ask that question. Uh, <laughs> um, oh, this is a good one. Let's do this one. This is topical. Uh, this is about the MVP race. If you were a voter, what analytics would you consider most important? I mean, this, and this is, I'm a voter, and like, Oh, I can't, I have no idea what I'm, like one through five, I don't know what I'm gonna do. But you guys are all very smart, like what are, what are the two, three, what, they wanna know what analytics should like be the tipping point in my decision. Nothing? We, we just spend so little time thinking about awards. Um, that is a good point. <laughs> I mean, for me, it's just like who has the biggest impact on winning the game? Yeah. Um, yeah we, so. The Winchester stat that uh, ESPN does, I think that's pretty, pretty good in terms of getting the value of, of a player. You know? I think that, that would be a, like a good starting point if you want to look for one. Okay. Yeah, I, I would do some, some sort of adjusted plus minus y thing per minute. I think there needs to be a whole other category minute, for an analytical minutes. award. It's like we have M NBA, WNBA first team, second team. Why not have some sort of not where it's just based on analytics, but a way of measuring in a different way. Because to me, I agree, MVP, it's like, you know, because you're watching and you can feel the impact. It's not like something you necessarily chart. Well, this, this year is interesting because we've got Russell Westbrook going for all the triple doubles and everything. And there was this sentiment that was, that was brought to me regarding baseball, Miguel Cabrera winning the triple crown a couple of years ago. And he wasn't the best player in baseball, but he did something that hadn't been done in forever, so you're gonna win. And there's that question regarding Russell. He's not having the biggest impact. He's having a very big impact, don't get me wrong. But because he's doing something that hasn't been done in 50 years, uh, there are a lot of people who vote for him because of a stat. Even though we say stats lie, there's going to be people who vote for him because of a stat that kind of lies. There will, be a, there will be a lot of people who vote for him because of that yeah. stat and that stat alone for sure. It's interesting. I like this one. Lower levels of basketball, they don't have sport view, they don't have fancy stuff, but like that's where, you know, that incubation is very important for, for basketball and for these kids. What, how can we apply analytics there? Like if you were a youth coach, what kind of stuff would you do? Lower levels, you're talking about below college, below top. Yeah, yeah, below, I, I just says lower levels, I'm assuming it means AAU or high school or like kids. I mean, what, is there any way to apply this stuff to that level? I like that question. I mean, at the highest levels of the lower levels, we're getting that information okay. now, but so I'm assuming we'll assume those people away, right? You're talking about just random high school team. Yeah, people. I thought this was an there interesting are, question. There are tools now that let you break down video of those uh, of, oh, there's sure, a couple yeah, of companies here, I know, yeah. um, that are doing the synergy-ish thing for high school games yeah. and, and youth league games. Um, and there's even tools that will let the coaches do that themselves. So, you know, cheap, easy video editing tools um, to do that stuff. So really the question is, what does the coach care most about? And, yeah. you know, then someone can go track it, either a company for you or you yourself using a tool that's not expensive. The software's gotten really cheap. So it's just a question of what do you care about? Points per possession is really big. That's, that's a useful one for a youth coach, Yeah, I guess. This is one that comes up every year, but um, why not ask it because it's good and, and the stats change every year. How do you guys measure coaching? So if we have a good, we have an ex-coach here. How do, how do you measure, do you, is it lineup data? The, co the, coach is, the, the question is just how do you measure if someone is a good coach or a bad coach? At the, at the most basic level, I think we do indirect measures of coaching because you can project what players are going to be through time and they start off bad as rookies and they get better. And then you look at when they're with coaches and not with coaches and you see whether those coaches incrementally made them better or worse. That's how you kind of start, but the problem is it doesn't tell you why. It doesn't tell you what they did, whether they were good tacticianers or they were good communicators or good player development. 
And I don't think we know how to marry those at all. So uh, I, I can't say we have a great answer. I, I don't have one. I mean, I, you know, there, there's some coaches that do a better job than others. Experience obviously matters. Who you're dealing with, you know, you, know, you look at some teams, you know, the low maintenance superstars to deal with them, obviously, because then everyone else falls in line. Uh, time is obviously key for a coach, practice time. How long is the team together? Um, is there a mixture of veteran guys with guys in their prime and younger players to build that culture? You're always trying to build that uh, winning culture. And those things takes time, but having that superstar that can kind of set the table for everybody I think is key. But as far as a coach, you know, the preparation, obviously game coaches. I've had some Hall of Fame coaches that I didn't think were great practice coaches, but in the game I believed in them. And especially at the end of the game, I really believed in them. And when you're on a good team and you want to have that confidence in a coach, end of the game things are very, very important. How you come out of timeouts, how you execute, what you're running, what adjustments you make during the game, but also the preparation going into the game. I've had some Hall of Fame coaches where we go through a game plan and we'll be in a timeout and it's the first quarter and we're down 10 or 15 points. You can just rip up that game plan and just boom, I'm gonna just start coaching you guys and we're gonna change this and we're gonna do that. And some guys just love that. I mean, they just kind of get into it like, hey, I'm just going to, first thing is you have to play hard. You have to play unselfish and you have to execute the game plan. Do your job. And that sounds easy, but some guys try to do more than they're capable of. But as a coach, you're always trying to get in the element. And I've had some great coaches and some great players that I played with, that I coached. And um, I've been very fortunate from that standpoint. Co Coaching is a bundle of skills like playing, sure. right? So some of those skills are easily measured and others are not, right? So you're going to go, some of them you'll go, you know, you can look at a guy, how, what a guy does with lineups and see sure. if he's playing some good lineups or not. Um, but some of it's how well does he teach guys things in practice? And that might be harder to measure, it might not. You know, there's a lot of those things. We don't spend a lot of time talking about who's a good player. We'll say, like, you know, who's a good screener, who... Right. Who's a good Who's a good shooter? Who's a good ball handler? All those things get divvied up into smaller and smaller things, and it's you could do the same with coaching um, to some extent. But many of the things that coaches do are human interaction things that are harder to measure than you know. Does a guy make shots from the right side? How many of the How many of the thirty coaches right now would you be comfortable classifying as good or bad coaches based on what? Like, do we we do like? Or because so, some people will say. I know that there are three good coaches and three bad coaches and like 24 guys. I have no idea if they're good or bad at their job, which seems like which seems like problematic to me. Um, yeah, when you when you need to make a coaching change, that's when you might look at that. Um, but I mean, I think there's a lot of smart coaches. I mean, I don't think coaches get enough credit to be honest with you. I mean, I'm obviously <laughs> they don't, but but I'm not as it's biased a hard as he is, but I agree. It, it's yeah. a hard oh, okay. job. Yeah. What'd you say, Dean? I'm not as biased as you are, but I yeah. agree. Yeah, so. I mean, it's a hard job. What I look at for coaches and what I'm most proud about with my, I want my teams to improve throughout the year. I want to see coaches that take this specific team, maybe you make a trade or maybe you do something to help your talent base, and it comes down to talent, obviously, but working together, the chemistry. I want my teams to improve, whether it's offensively and defensively, and have a balance. I don't want to be great in offense and poor in defense. I don't want to be great in defense. I want it to be a blend so I can have a balance statistically so I can use all these numbers to get to that point. I want, I'm still waiting for the day when we get a coach to say something not 100% nice about another coach. That's what <laughs> I want. I want one coach to come out and say something like even it's like the unsuccessful surgery about another press coach. release. That's like the yeah, holy grail. That that's that's the year. holy grail of the Sloan Conference. <laughs> to get a coach criticizing a coach. Like this this is good. You're going to hate this question. Um, <laughs> the NBA this. just released a, is like all this new planning for how we're going to track officials and officiating. And this would be the Bob Volgaris question if he were here. Uh, I don't, this is for anybody. Like, if you could just dive into that data, what would you be interested to know about referees and how they're performing and how they're doing their jobs? And even more broadly than that, this is a question that people ask me a lot, particularly from the league, like what constitutes a well-officiated game? Because the league really struggles with that. Like you really want us to call every foul because then the game will be three hours. You really want us to call no fouls and then you get mugged. So like what, if you could look at that data, what would you be curious to see about referees? I, I like the, the things the NBA does with referee. I think this is pretty much the only league in the world that does that, at least in basketball. And they do it very openly. They do it very clearly. I think it's a good thing. Uh, it, I changed my per perspective towards uh, ref during, during the years. You, all, you know, while I was young, I was always thinking they were 
making bad calls and oh my God, all those things. But then I learned, you know, they, they work very hard at it. They make mistakes, obviously, but most of the calls are wrong, uh, I'm sorry, are right. And, <laughs> <laughs> and most of the calls are right, and most of the time you are wrong. You know, you're thinking, oh my God, that was a clear foul. And then you see it the third time, and it's like, Maybe it wasn't a foul. And you got three times to watch it, three different angles. They got to make the call, they got to make the call on site. And I think they do a great job. Obviously, they got room for improvement, but I think the game is fair, and that's what you want. The game to be fair, and they call everybody the same, and they just do it for the, the same way every game of the season. And I think they do a good job at that. Um, I believe also the, all the statements they release, they're healthy, they help. Um, sometimes you might be mad because it's against you. Sometimes you might be happy because it helped you. But um, I think they're doing a good job, and they're going to continue to do better at that. I'm, I'm, I'm happy with them. I think it's weird that people are like upset about the transparency in this area, right? Because this is sports. We all talk about how much we're happy or upset about something that happens on the court, and so like. Paul Pierce takes a bad shot, doesn't mean you, you go, crap, shouldn't have taken that shot. Doesn't mean Paul Pierce is a bad player, just he took a bad shot, right? Um, so why are we upset, or why are people upset? I understand why the officials would be upset for being criticized, but like we're already upset about stuff that happens on the court, and we should at least know if they're doing a good job or not, because then you take out the, oh, there's some bias against us part of it. And I think that's the purpose of the transparency issue from the league. They're gonna get calls wrong. We, you know, I spend time watching a lot of other leagues, and for all the grief that people inside teams give NBA refs, I, I'm not trading our refs for other leagues' refs. Like, we have the best refs. But consistency, as a player, as a coach, how are you going to call it in the first quarter to the fourth quarter? Players get in a rhythm in a game. They want to know, is it, is it going to be a, a physical, more of a physical game or not? And then now the pace of the game is so fast, why not add, why not add a fourth referee? I mean, the guys can't catch up to the play. It's We've so fast now. I don't know how you know well what I mean? Going. Like, maybe, it, you know, we can't say it's because of money. There's plenty of money in the NBA, and it's a better product. But the game is so fast, some of the refs can't get angles that they used to because the threes and the spreading of the game. We've talked sometimes about, like, having someone up there who can actually see. Because, like, yeah. on the court, you can't see out of bounds calls. It's like a weird oh, angle. They do. But someone, they got the camera system. Well, now they do, yeah. And I, I, I'm a, a little bit against the, the official review because sometimes it takes so long. Yeah. Yeah. It's like, you didn't have the call on site, that's great. You should have whatever, 30 seconds to make the call. You get like 10 different replays and that's your call, you know? You got a little bit more of an advantage, but you went in there two and a minutes and a half and we all waiting for you to decide which side it goes. I think it has to be much faster and the guys upstairs, maybe sometimes they say, hey, this way. And it's like a five-second thing. I, they're getting better at it, but last year it was it was a problem. The fact that the league is willing to engage with the teams, I think the yeah, group great. Byron is leading now at the league is doing a really good, and Evan are doing a really good job of making the teams feel at least like, all right, we understand the process you're doing behind the scenes to make sure that these officials are doing a good job. We can submit things that we get feedback. Um, you know, we're still going to be really upset if a call goes against us. It's just the way the world is, right? Yeah. But at least you feel like there's some process behind it that's not completely random. Um, there aren't questions about, you know, is this somehow one way or another against you? It, it's not. You can see they have a whole process set up now. It's really good. There is um, a request for Luis to do his Dikembe Mutombo impression. And I feel like we're, we're at, do you, do you, do, I don't even know that you I'm have one. That was in the analytics that. category, right? That was in the end. That's a very serious question. So you're not going to do it? You won't, you won't do it? No. I have never seen, I've never heard it before. I don't know. If no, no. I can't do it, you can't, no. <laughs> he's everywhere, he's probably here. <laughs> everywhere I go, he's here. Uh, did you read George Carl's book? That's another question. I haven't read it yet, no. Okay. Um, <laughs> last wow. one, and then we're out of time. I think we're... Uh, I know his stories. You know, yeah, you were there for some of the stories. Do you ever, is there real time, this is the last question, is there any real time data that actually gets filtered down to coaches at this point? Obviously you see the players with the iPads looking at film, but is there ever real time data, like you get to the last two minutes of a game and, and like this has been working, this hasn't been working, or are we not there? Or should we ever even What do you mean there? by real time data? They have the box score, like that's what's going on. There's a screen, that scores that, table. Okay, better data than that. We're tracking our own plays and things. Coaches, coaches are super freaking smart. If you ask a coach at the end of the first quarter what happened Good over boy. the first quarter, yeah. most of the coaches I've worked with can talk to you about every play and most of the things that happened. And so um, we find that in-game 
you know, there, you, you'll keep track of like what plays you ran. There's someone on the bench doing that, or our video guys. Um, you can have a computer on the bench now, which is a change. Yeah. So you actually can have a display of a bunch of stuff. But um, the coaches are pretty sharp. And the games. staffs are so big now, too. Human, I mean, you have so many minds staff. are good at short-term patterns. It's the longer-term patterns. People's brains aren't great. And you have, a lot of times, you have good players who, like, George would ask some of his best players, like, what did you see? Yeah. What do you think we should do For against sure. this guy? And that's, they're, they're pretty good. And I know if I'm looking at the numbers and I'm watching the game and trying to keep them, they still see more than I do. I think we are officially out of time. So thanks to Dean, Sue, Vinny, Mike, and Luis for yes. doing the basketball analytics. Great job, Zach. <laughs>